TZ Economics, the Hawaii Economics Consultancy. His background in research on the Hawaii economy and financial risk analytics stems from a 25-year affiliation with Bank of Hawaii, concluding as its chief economist. He's a graduate of Stanford University, did graduate work at the University of Wisconsin, and received his PhD in economics from the University of Hawaii. He has lectured extensively in international, monetary, and financial economics. He's a member of the American Economic Association, the American Finance Association, and the National Association for Business Economics, from which he holds the Certified Business Economics Economist designation. Let's all welcome Paul Rubik. Good morning, and uh, thanks to the sponsors for getting this all together. Sorry for the late arrival. I seem to have parked on the 15th hole or something. <laughs> I, I want to start just by um, mentioning a couple of questions that Chris had asked on behalf of the uh, regional group uh, that I contemplate uh, addressing. I'm not going to be able to do hardly any of them. But um, I understand you're going to have a discussion later on the proposed constitutional amendment for a state tax surcharge on investment property, so I'll leave that one alone. Uh, it seems like a really bad idea. Uh, I really don't have any insight uh, as to effects of natural disasters on the Big Island and on Kauai, the floods earlier um, in the spring and then more recently the um, volcanism. Um, it, it occurs to me that if you tr if you take advantage of the availability of daily um, passenger counts, passenger arrivals, you can pretty much see in real time what's happening uh, with tourism. And while I realize there's a certain amount of island hopping that occurs, um, the totals, as has now been confirmed by the visitor counts, the, the actual tourist enumeration, um, the totals continue to grow. So, I mean, sorry for North Shore of Hawaii and, and Puna District, but people are still coming to Hawaii. And that's kind of a classic pattern which we've seen before with other island-specific uh, catastrophic events. So I would say, well, chalk another one up to the amazing flexibility of the destination offerings here in Hawaii, but it is nevertheless um, problematic uh, for both of those other islands. And then uh, finally, I was asked to comment on Coal Ridge and its impact on central Oahu. I'll tell you what, I, I worked for them about five years ago, and I was trying to find my forecast uh, at that time, um, which, if I recall correctly, and Harry Saunders likes to joke with me about it, I, I had assumed that by 2018, everything would be done. Like, in my forecast, this was 2013, and we're gonna ramp up Coal Ridge, and then we're gonna build it out, and then we'll be done. So, they haven't even started. They haven't even enabled it. <laughs> This has been going on for 20 years, so, so much for that forecast. Um, by the way, I learned another really interesting thing from Harry. He, we were having him testify for some stupid thing. And, um, <laughs> should we build houses? <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> Can we have another hearing? Sure. <laughs> um, so, so uh, among the opponents um, were a group that or name, remain unnamed, who hypothesized Granger causality, which is an economic term for, you know, thing A causes thing B to happen. Um, and their thesis is that the more houses you build, uh, the more traffic you get. And at the time, my son had just moved back to Hawaii. Um, he was working with Tesla, and I told him, dude, you're never gonna get another job like this, so. Um, and then he hung out long enough to know that that company was well, so he went back to uh, even bolder. Um, but of course, he had to live with me for a while. And uh, I had this test, so these guys are testifying, right? And they're like, oh, when you build a new house, you know, it makes more traffic. And I'm like, so what's the theory here? So we build a house, my son moves out of my house and into that house, and he buys a new car? Because he's got three cars outside my house right now, and granted, one of them is a Tesla that he has to drive home on the weekend, which was really cool. Um, and then they stopped doing that. But for a while, nobody knew what a Tesla was, right? So they would, the employees would all drive cars home for the weekend, and then we'd drive around and show the car off, and people were like, "What's that?" Anyway, 
Uh, yeah, so those days are gone. So yeah, no, when you build a new housing unit, people don't go out and buy two new cars. It just doesn't work like that. And Heron's favorite statistic was that the rate of growth, he compiled some data showing that the rate of growth of the number of registered motor vehicles in Hawaii actually outpaced the rate of growth of housing units by a substantial margin. I thought, well, that's really interesting. So the next time I was presenting to the Auto Dealers Association, I compiled all the data, and I can tell you that there are approximately three times as many cars per person. There's three times, or like 2.78 times, as many registered motor vehicles per person in Hawaii than there were at the time of statehood a half century ago. Well, there aren't three times as many housing units per person as there were 50 years ago in Hawaii. So it's just ridiculous to say that houses cause cars. I don't even understand. I, I mean, what idiot came up with that idea? <laughs> so, I'll tell you another story. So I actually testified for these same guys. I was in the whole Peely case. They were like, oh, you gotta testify in whole Peely. And I'm like, how do you do that? Well, you have to be like an affected party or something like that. I don't want an affected party. That's some lawyer thing. Okay, so who am I gonna, okay, you have to testify for these guys. And I'm like, hell no, I gotta testify for those guys. Yeah, that's the only way you can testify. So I had to testify for those guys. And um, so I go into the meeting with the attorneys and they're like, well, right, houses cause cars, that's our thing. And I'm like, no, they don't. I thought we we're here to preserve the Aina or something like that. So that's, that's what I thought. <laughs> preserve ag land, because you don't know what agriculture is gonna be in 2050, but it might be the cure for cancer. So wouldn't it suck if you paved it over and now you can't grow the cure for cancer? I'm just saying. You preserve ag land to keep your options open, and that's why you make tall buildings. Duh. So, <laughs> so that's my comment on Coal Ridge, which is not actually a comment on Coal Ridge, except that I'm still waiting, like everybody else, and uh, these poor guys. So, um, if I ever work for them again, can't. Um, I will let you know what I find out, because five years ago, everything I told them, you know, about what the potential was correct, and everything I predicted in terms of the outcome was completely false. They haven't even, they have to build an off-ramp next to the off-ramp. <laughs> Check this out, they have, you know where the Kogoko Boulevard off-ramp is? They gotta build another off-ramp. Who does that? You wanna build a house, yeah, you gotta build an off-ramp. They have to, if I recall correctly, they have to replace the sewer on Kamehameha Highway up to the new line. Mm -hmm. wow. So let me get this straight. The new guy pays for the old guy's sewer replacement. Is that how that works? Is that how we do affordable housing? The new guy pays for the off-ramp. The rest of us just go Costco. Right? That's how that works? And you're asking me why there's no affordable housing? I guess we just solved that problem. So remember the days when everybody built Holly Highway and the Leaky Leaky Highway? Remember, everybody built a highway. You put money inside, and the legislature make, like, takes the revenue and it spends it on teachers, right? And then public education. <laughs> and now the teacher's great idea is, oh, we should tax investment property. I thought, what's that right? You own your house, yeah? Oh, then it's an investment property, dumbass. <laughs> don't, you teach, don't you teach people this in school? If you buy a house, you're an investor. Basololo, so what? <laughs> So that's all I'll say about my special list of, <laughs> and I'll have one substantive comment at the end. Okay, so here are the here are the data from your um, boards that are regional. Here's how you read the bubbles, right? So if it's on the right side of the screen, that means sales are rising, and if it's on the left side, sales are falling. Okay, if it's the top of the screen, prices are going up. If it's at the bottom of the screen. Prices are going down, right? So you wanna be in the upper right-hand corner yeah. where sales are rising and prices are rising, right? And you don't wanna be in the lower left-hand corner, which I've shaded gray there. The lower quadrant where sales, volumes, and prices are falling is like, let's avoid this area, if at all possible. Got it? So which way are the bubbles moving? From right to left. From sales increase last year to sales decrease in the first half of this year. Mm, that's interesting. 
And which way are prices moving? Uh, kind of mixed, yeah? Kind of a little bit higher, a little bit lower appreciation, and then your mileage may vary. So the appreciation rates net-net probably haven't changed that much, right? Hawaii Kai's up a little, Kapahula's up a little, Aina Aina, why I like the holla down a little, right, from last year? So you're kind of moving from the right side to the left side with the kind of a mixed pattern for appreciation. There's, there, there has been some depreciation in the Waikai Kahala space last calendar year, but that's not a large sample. So, you know, that can, you can have one big trade in the previous year uh, affect that uh, neighborhood. So here, those are the single family homes here, the condos, and I don't have yeah. <laughs> Single family, okay, condos, right? Why well, I like Kahala moving into the, into the gray zone, right? Hawaii Kai bucking the trend with higher sales in the first half of last, this year, last after a bit of a fade in 2017. And then a couple of those diamond head uh, drifting off from relatively rapid volume growth in 2017. So yeah, mixed, mostly moving from left to right except for the last 10 condos in Hawaii Kai. To be continued. Right, the bubble size is based on uh, median prices. Right, so the biggest bubbles are the big yellow bubbles of Wild like Kahala, single family. Okay, sales volumes in the current expansion, as you can see, are moving upward at a steady pace since the Great Recession. The, the gray, I feel like, okay, home prices rising at a slower but steady pace, this current expansion, relative to the last the prior expansion, which originated in the late 1990s and had kind of a, you know, speed bump with the 2000 recession. So that's good in one sense, it, you know, in principle, it won't flame out as fast this time. And I don't see, you know, looking out across the room at it from here, I don't see a lot of curvature there, right? What you're looking for at the tail end is the volume starting to drift off. You're getting that in East Honolulu, which is kind of the bellwether, right? It happens first in East, in East Oahu. So I'd be, I'd be keeping an eye out for that. In terms of, Inventories remaining, you've seen this relatively stable pattern, but if you look very carefully, now seasonally adjust these data, if you look very carefully at the first six months of this year, there's been just a tiny bit of upward drift from about two and a half, two and a quarter days, uh, months remaining, uh, to about you know two and three quarters uh, months of the two and a half, two and three quarters months of inventory remaining. So keep an eye on that, because it hasn't been a steady ascent however small. It looks, it looks like, you know, looks like a bottom. So keep an eye on that. Um, and uh, production, I think, is pretty much at the peak for the current cycle. Um, it's a little harder to interpret these days because there's so much um, bunching, right? These are, these are lumpy commitments to build 400 story, uh, 400 units at a time kind of buildings, right? Rather than 3,500 units at Koa Ridge, never one unit at a time, probably not. But I mean, I shouldn't say that. They will build it eventually. It's just, we'll be dead. <laughs> <laughs> and they, these guys, these poor guys, they had to go to the state Supreme Court. Who has to go to the freaking state Supreme Court to get permission to build on their own land across the street from Costco? You gotta go to the state Supreme Court to get permission to build houses on your own land across the street from Costco. What on earth? What? I don't understand that. 20 years they spent in litigation and whatever. Okay, so this looks like, looking like the, the peak of the cycle. You know, the way I gauge this is, have you been counting cranes? Have you realized they're the same cranes now? There's no new cranes. So that's been going on for a couple of years. It's the same crane. Now it's on this side of Ola Moana Center instead of the other side. But actually, there's a little more cranes at Ola Moana, right? They're all kind of going around Kaka Ako, right? And here, oh yeah, here's another. This is a stroke of genius. You know where we should build affordable housing in Honolulu? On the most expensive land on the island. Here's a good idea. Let's build micro units in Kaka Ako instead of apartment buildings 
in Waipahu. They'll just love you to death. Thank you so much for billing at the train station in Kaka freaking Ako. <laughs> right? Thank you for my 280 square feet, also known as my mom's closet. Right? Have you seen this building? Oh, get balcony. Yeah, one unit has a balcony. <laughs> I just, my wife and I were watching this on TV the other night. Ooh, artist, architect's rendering, right? They're like, oh, including balconies. I'm like, plural? Because I'm looking at the plan and there's one building. I mean, there's like one unit that has a balcony. Uh, finally, I hear a lot of people talking about affordability and, uh, and homelessness and, you know, just everything. Okay, I think we talked about this before. Like, so homelessness is not about housing affordability. Right? It's about the deinstitutionalization of mental health. It's about substance abuse. It's about the way we mistreat our veterans. But it's mostly not about people who couldn't make their mortgage payment. Mostly. And yes, there's economic mobility, right, up and down the food chain. Sometimes you're rich, sometimes you're not. Then you're rich again. Right? Sometimes you're a one-hit wonder, then you're the one-hit wonder from 10 years ago, call me baby, or whatever, and nobody <laughs> remembers your name. Okay? That happens. And so some of those guys, yeah, that happened. And maybe they got stuck there. But it's not primarily about the fact that housing is too expensive. And by the way, how expensive is housing? Well, let's do the, con the conventional housing affordability calculation. You take the median single family home price, that's the convention, the national convention, right? You take the median single family home price, you do the calculation for a four person family at the median income under conventional lending assumptions with the 25% down payment, right? And what proportion of income is, uh, comprises the, uh, the debt service on the house? Answer. 35%. Medium income, medium home price, conventional lending assumptions, 30 year fixed rate mortgage rate. Do the math yourself. I've been doing the math for 40 years. The 20 teens has been one of the great extended moments of housing affordability, not unlike the early 2000s until the moment the bubble blew out and ended the whole thing. And that could happen, you know, tomorrow. So far, rising interest rates haven't done it. They haven't risen enough. Okay? So, I don't know, you know, if anybody was talked out of buying a house in the 20 teens because they read in the paper that housing wasn't affordable, so they moved to Denver, then, I'm sorry, it doesn't get much better than it's been in Hawaii. Hawaii is not cheap. Cool places are not cheap. That's just the way real estate works, right? The, the, the places you'd be most stoked to live in are the most expensive, pla expensive places to live in. And, and people make their choices, right? They can live in a 300 unit, 300 square foot micro unit in Kakako, and they can go to the bar at Whole Foods and drink organic vodka every night. <laughs> or, what the hell is that organic vodka? It's freaking distilled alcohol. <laughs> organic. <laughs> Better living through chemistry, try that. Or, right, they could live in an 800 square foot, one bedroom unit in Waikahu and have money left over to go play lunch. Which, pe which do people choose? Right? Us peasants, we all live in Waipahu. And if you live in Kakako, then bully for you. You know what I mean? But that's, you can build affordable, okay, I'm just saying. There is no affordable housing crisis. There's not enough housing being built, that's not the same thing. Right? Is there any housing being built at the Waipahu train station? Have you seen the Waipahu train station? It's like freaking 800 feet high. It's like so, I swear to God, it's taller than the first Hawaiian Bank building. 
Because right? that's the rule, right? Thou shalt not build bigger than Walter Dodds. <laughs> it's not 402 feet, it's not 397. Wait, it's not 413 and a half feet. It's 400 feet. Hey, right, that's how big the train station is. Right, well, you gotta see this freaking train station. Now, Bob, it's so tall. Right, it's taller than the tallest apartment building in Waipahu. <laughs> Think about that for a second. Oh, okay. yeah. All right, so here we go. Oh, one last thing. Oh, people are leaving uh, Oahu in larger numbers than um, all other sources of population growth combined. So that's the effect of not building enough housing, right? It's not inaffordable. I even put in, I put in like the FHFA threshold, I put in the Fannie Mae, debt, right, debt service to income, these are debt service to income thresholds, not debt to income. Does it say debt to income on yours? It's supposed to say debt, debt service to income. It says that in the headline. Okay, so yeah, so, and the, and the response of people in Hawaii, they're voting with their feet. They're leaving Hawaii in larger numbers. Residents are leaving Hawaii, are leaving Oahu, in numbers larger than all other sources of population growth combined. Boom, vote for that. <laughs> okay. I'm not making that up. That's, it's so good, people are bailing. Okay. I know, right? It's just like, did you did you see anybody with a, a campaign ad that say, holy crap, people are bailing from Hawaii, from, good, from Oahu. Okay, it's Oahu the last two years, but as you can see, this has been going on and getting bigger and bigger for some time, pretty much the entire 21st century. But now it's so big, right? The bottom bar, people are leaving in large numbers that are so large that births, less deaths, plus net international in migration is small. Okay, so and, and for the last year that happened statewide. Okay, so let's talk a little about valuations. Here's the distribution of home prices I truncated um, to top off the top 1% or the top 1.1%, okay? Somebody got all upset about this at another regional meeting and somebody left me a voicemail and said, oh, we like the high end, and I go, fine. We love the high end, give them a tax cut. But look, 98.9%, 98.9% of all Oahu transactions last year are in this picture. The other 1.1% from two and a half million to whatever, whatever. <laughs> okay, they don't have an affordable housing crisis at the $10 million price point. So this is where people live. There's your measures of central tenancy. I approximate that with a, a gamma distribution. Okay, you with me? Median, mean. And there's the one of the arbitrary $1 million threshold that the advertisers decided is we all have to talk about $1 million because we, our, our real estate reporter is Dr. Evil. One million dollars. Ooh, the, every month. Ooh, the price was almost one million dollars. Right? Have you been reading the paper for the last four hundred days? The mean price. Wait, wait, mean. Who does mean price? Oh, we do because it's almost one million dollars. Okay. Okay. Ready? So here's what the last this, this current cycle looks like: 2011, 2012, 13, 14, 15, 16. So that looks pretty much distribution preserving, yeah? 2011, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. So no shape-shifting, weirdness. I did all that work and nothing. <laughs> so that means that when prices are going up, right, prices are going up at the low end, at the left, and prices are going up at the high end, at the right, including the top 1.1%, which, sorry, don't make the cut. Right? Okay, got it? So the shape of the distribution is not changing. There's no wacky changes here. There are on some of the other islands. And that means that the steady rise in home prices we've seen has been across the distribution, more or less. We use the median, right? We use that one benchmark, the, the halfway point, to track valuation dynamics. But you can see the whole distribution 
right? Where's the median? It's that heavy, heavy line. That's the halfway point, right? Half the area is below that. Half the area is above that. Yeah? Or half the area minus the 1.1% above 2.5 or 2.6 million. Okay, so in your mind's eye, think of that heavy line moving to the right at a steady pace. The whole distribution is going up. And that's what we're talking about when we say the medians are rising at a steady pace. But if you look carefully, as I can from across the room, you can see a little bit of curvature now in that single family, the top time series. It's not straight. It's flattening out. And if I look carefully, I'm running the regression in my eyeball right now. That looks like it's starting to curve. It's starting to flatten ever so slightly. So you know what I do? I run the regression, and then I use conventional tests. Which one is the better fit, the curvy one or the straight one? Right? And right now, for single family homes, the Aka EK information criterion for the curvy one is slightly lower, which means better, than it is for the log linear projection. So, single family homes were appreciating at what, 4%? And now I'm getting that projection 2.5%. Yeah, if you push it out, if you push the same line or now curve out. So that's what we're looking for at the end of the cycle. Are things starting to lose the upper momentum? Is the S, we're re reaching the top of the escalator? Because it was an escalator, not a roller coaster. Are we reaching the top of the escalator? We're gonna get off to the next floor and then what? It's all on a center, you have no idea where the next escalator is. Well, all around. <laughs> <laughs> so there's the roller coaster from the past. And yes, the, the, the 20 teens have had this distinctive steady pattern that's right on the long-term trend. I mean, it's kind of remarkable. So these are your board's median prices, but we have broader valuation estimates from the Federal Housing Finance Administration that go back a little further. And yeah, the, these are for Oahu, Maui, and the other neighbor islands. All, I just lumped them all together. We're aligning them all together. And you see that line, that's the linear trend, if you assume it's linear, which is more like five or 6% appreciation over time. And you can see how Oahu hooked right up with that long-term trend in the 20 teens. So it's a very stable, you know, Goldilocks market, not too hot, not too cold. And we thought, well, maybe we'll just continue. And now we're seeing a little bit of fade in a couple of the measures and maybe one or two of the neighborhoods that lead us to think, okay, maybe we should start thinking about what the end of this real estate cycle would look like and when, we would, when it would become obvious. Because for a long time, it's just been a momentum story. And, and well, let me come back to this, but I'm thinking, you know, we gotta start thinking about that. If you, if you run this out, this is just the Wahoo, yeah? And that is a remarkable, you know, we keep coming back to that trend. So that's, a, right, that's actually a good thing, right? It suggests there's a kind of dynamic equilibrium to which valuations return. When we get out of alignment above the trend, things happen that cause it to go back and vice versa when we go way below. If you adjust for inflation, right? So now I take the inflation out of Oahu valuations, and I again run that regression. You can you can see once more a little bit of long-term curvature in the real rate of appreciation. Now the current slope is two percent ish, two percent real appreciation, to which you add the dividend, right? What's the dividend? You get to live in the house. So price appreciation plus the dividend is the total return, and investors. I think, and everybody that owns a house is an investment, and every house is an investment property. So, so much for a constitutional amendment that will surtax investment properties because they're all investment properties. Even Kamehameha Schools land, where they say we will never sell as the yeah, sure, except when you own Goldman Sachs. Okay, so it's just another asset in the portfolio. You can see now that curvature in real terms, that reflects something deeper in the economy. This economy used to be an economy in the, the mid-20th century uh, or in the beginning of the last quarter of the 20th century that generated higher returns, higher real returns, the slope was steeper slightly, than it does today. So something really different has unfolded in the economy. And if you go back, because Dr. Evil is telling us we should use mean prices now, Go back 
1958, for which I have me, Oahu, single family home prices. You can see that curvature even more distinctly. That is to say, in the late territorial, early statehood, when you could build anything you wanted anywhere, you could pave over Wailupi fish pond. And it I mean, what? Talk about the pendulum swing. You, wait, Kakako Regional Park is on the landfill that we dump into the ocean? Is that why the search spot was called Flies and Incinerators? Remember, when we were kids, Point Panic, Flies, Incinerators. Those are the search spots. Now I know. Thanks for the heads up. Good thing I got that coral cut by the dump. <laughs> okay, that's how we used to roll. And yes, in that kind of a wild west environment, you can build anything anywhere, right? You have higher returns than an environment where it takes you 20 years to build land that you've owned, on land that you've owned for 150 years across the street from Costco, which already has an off-ramp from the H2 freeway, like next to the freeway. That's how easy it is. It takes 20 years and you still can't build. So in that world, the returns are lower. The real rate of return to capital is lower because the odds you'll actually be able to do the investment are lower. And if you look carefully, that 1.0, that 1 million horizontal line there, that's starting to look like an upper bound in real terms. Okay, that's not a good thing. You're telling me that, I mean, I'm just look, I'm just eyeballing it from across the room. It looks like it's curving, it looks like it's flattening, and yes, there were cycles of large damage to the roller coaster of the Japan bubble and stuff like that. But now it's kind of back on that trend. It's well within the two standard deviation bandwidth, the, the blue area around it, yeah. And it's looking like it's, the trend is flattening out. That can't, it can't be a good thing for the trend to flatten out. If the trend flattens out, you might as well just buy treasury bonds and rent, right? If the yield on the 10-year treasury note is 3% and you're guaranteed unless, you know, a certain political party blows up the country, right? If you're guaranteed you get 3% from the US treasury and it's not clear you're gonna get, I mean, you can get zero return plus the dividend, you get to live in the house. Hell, I can rent a house and live in the house. So that's some interesting math to think about from an investor standpoint. Finally, just a few comments about where we're at in the economy because GDP came out recently and people are talking about it. Hawaii GDP growth came out of the recession. You can see the big negative GDP growth rates in 2008, 2009. With a, with a tourism led resurgence, so the growth in 2010 in particular was very robust. And you can see a 4% number there at the top which Hawaii had, even Hawaii had. And then we went through a period at the end of the Abercrombie administration where things petered out. I think high oil prices had a lot to do with that. Right, at $120 a barrel, that's a full on headwind, right, pushing back on the economy. Because um, we don't drill oil, we just burn it. Uh, but then we had the crane thing, and so we had an investment-led second half to the expansion, which has since begun to drift off. All in all, Hawaii's growth, ha growth rate has been less than the nation's, something like 1.8%, versus the national GDP growth rate of 2.3%. This has been revised as of last week. And of course, um, the president has been uh, very enthusiastic about the 4% growth rate in the second quarter this year, which would only be the one, two, three, four, fifth time that we've had 4% growth. Uh, since the recession nationwide, so, yay. Um, we knew this was coming, the forecast among economists, that line at the end was that the tax cut would have a little, you know, give you a little temporary fiscal boost and then would peter out uh, in 2020. And that's the collision course we're headed on now because we know the monetary policy is normalizing and should be concluding interest rate and balance and Federal Reserve balance sheet normalization uh, by about 2020, maybe 2022. So right at the moment that the fiscal impulse fades and the deficits are ginormous and federal borrowing of something like a, 
I mean, I can't believe these numbers. Is it a trillion dollars a year? So that's your competition for mortgage finance, the US Treasury. You know, think about what that's gonna do to interest rates. Right at that moment, uh, you know, the Fed concludes interest rate uh, normalization. The Fed's own forecast for growth over the next couple of years has the same profile, a little tax cut induced surge in GDP growth converging to the potential GDP growth rate that is the full employment trajectory, which the Fed estimates at 1.7%, the Congressional Budget Office estimates at 1.8%, I mean, everybody's in the same neighborhood, except for the administration. And in the long run, I only have data since uh, the Revolutionary War, but if you look at real per capita GDP, okay, real per capita, output per person in real terms for 200, almost 50 years. The most stunning thing is right at the tail end, when you see the deviations from trend, that's the yellow band, that's the actual minus the trend for 250 years. You can see the deviations slipping below the yellow bandwidth. That is, output per capita is not keeping up in the 20 teens with the trend since the Industrial Revolution began. And nobody knows why, but this is not a good thing. And it could be fake book. Could be fake book. You guys are all old like me. You have fake book accounts, right? Fake book. You know what I'm talking about, right? You used to be a MySpace guy, and now you're a fake book guy. Uh, I, I'm sorry. Google is the NSA. This is what I'm talking about. Google knows you're here. Google has a little chart. When are people at Wildlife Country Club? Well, when the regional meeting happens, whoop, the bar chart goes up. Okay, I'm just telling you. No, dude, Facebook tracks your phone even if you're not a Facebook user. Figure that one out. Okay, so when you ask economists, I think I'm making this stuff up. Right? When you ask economists when they think the next recession comes, uh, the distribution of responses is one-third says not before 2021, and of the remaining two-thirds, the central tendency of the expectation is in early 2020. So again, it's time to start thinking about where we end up in what probably will end up being the longest expansion in U.S. history. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut through some of this. This is a, a real estate survey, a similar sort to the economic survey. You can get a copy of the PDF from your, from your board. Uh, this is on your computer, so you can just send it to everybody. There's a really interesting real estate survey that says we're in a late stage part of the cycle when you survey nationwide. When you ask economists what the net effect of trade policy on U.S. real GDP growth is, 75% of respondents say marginally negative, moderately negative, or strongly negative, and only 12% say that it will have positive effects. So again, you've got a collision course of policies whether it's fiscal policy uh, and monetary policy and now trade policy, when you ask economists about the impacts of rising interest rates, a majority say, uh, the a slight majority, but 54% say the impacts will be negative and only 10% say positive, and I think that's more in tune than the others. The decomposition of Hawaii GDP growth, which you're seeing here, the dark portion of each bar, is the investment component of GDP growth in Hawaii. So again, you can see, as we talked about a second ago, that investment-led second surge of GDP growth, right, the, the cranes, that is now petering out, that's now you know, slowing down. And by a similar token, a lot of people have been looking for this in the US data. So here's the latest US data. The dark red portion of each bar, that's the investment portion, capital formation. The dark blue portion is consumption. So since the mid-20-teens, this has been a consumption-led expansion. This is fine, right? With a little bit of investment participation, but not as much as one might have thought, given that the tax cut was supposed to be a stimulus for investment. And again, part of the competition for loanable funding now is, is coming from, and will increasingly be coming from, the US Treasury, which will have to fund deficits that previously were not in the picture. The Fed plans to normalize interest rates. They've been telling this for years. The only thing that changes is you know, slight modifications to the path. Now they have an overshoot. You see that overshoot in the overnight 
interest rate that they predict out in 2020. So they, the, the economy is going fast enough that they'll have to step on the brakes harder than previously thought. And that's why the short, right, the overnight rate, they expect to go over the equilibrium rate, over 3%, go up three and a half, and then work its way back. I would say, however, that a 3% mortgage, I mean a 3.5%, um, even if you got to a 3.5% yield on the 10-year treasury note, which I'm not sure we're gonna get to, mortgage rates would be up around, you know, over a five handle, and that's more expensive than a 4.5% mortgage, but it's not, you know, it's not the kiss of death. So it's gonna be a little tougher sledding. Qualification's already problematic, and it's not gonna get any easier. But I, I don't think this is primarily uh, an interest rate recession risk that we're talking about at this point. And, and mostly because nobody on the planet, at this point, there can't be anybody on the planet that doesn't know what the Fed is doing. Here, here's the picture. They post their data. I can take their data, on, uh, and, I, and their surveys of this, in this case I took the survey for 10 year treasury note yields, I ran a regression of mortgage rates, and the answer is take the 10 year treasury note yield, add 173 basis points, 1.73%, 1, 1 and that gives you your 30, your 30 average 30 year fixed rate mortgage rate. I mean, on average, that's you know how to do the math. So surely by now everybody knows this is coming. And of course, finally, the, the, the Fed's balance sheet, which ballooned in response to the worst financial crisis in human history, Right? The Fed's balance sheet balloon, but it's now beginning to deflate. You see at the tail end that it's starting to curve in. And they've been telling this to us for two years that this was coming. In fact, way back in 2014, that's four years ago, Ben Bernanke inadvertently in a, in a press conference said that, well, we might, somebody asked, well, are you going to let the securities mature off your balance sheet or you know, or would you would you sell securities, right? Well, if the Fed sells securities, that puts downward pressure on bond prices and raises bond yields, right? So that's why the reporter asked the question. And Bernanke said, sure, I mean, we could sell treasuries. And oh my God, that's the taper tantrum. That's when there's a huge bond market sell-off, right? And it was like, don't say that again, right? So that was four years ago. So if you did, if you just come out of your cave and you don't know this is happening, the Fed's balance sheet is going to decline. They're at 40 billion a month. I thought it was 80 by now, but evidently somebody told me it was only 40. So they're allowing 40 billion a month in securities to mature off their balance sheet while they normalize the term structure of interest rates. But the problem, of course, is that you put all those things together and, and, and a completely unnecessary fiscal stimulus. I mean, what, you need stimulus at the beginning Right? You need stimulus coming out of the recession. You don't need it when the unemployment rate is 2% because the unemployment rate is 2%, right? Every company's got a job, or whatever, 4% or whatever it is nationwide. It's 2% in Hawaii. Just, you're all stealing each other's best top sellers, right? Because who, else, who are you gonna hire? They weren't born, and they're leaving Oahu. So you have a lot of pressure in the economy right at the tail end of the expansion coming from the fact we're already at full employment and a couple technical things like oil prices coming back from 40 to $70 a barrel are gonna start showing up in inflation statistics, which everybody anticipated. You've got the Fed normalizing interest rates, meaning they'll be higher, the term structure, take, it's gonna be 3%, the term structure of interest rates, which means, and then maybe we'll overshoot a little to three and a half, which means that the mortgage rate will go up to five and maybe tread a little higher than that. But you know, you sort of, sort of know where the zone is. The, ten, the yield on the 10%, I'm sorry, the yield on the 10-year treasury note today is already back to 3%. So that's kind of the zone, you know, two and a half to three and a half percent. And and then you've got the fiscal stimulus, which, okay, whatever, which, that's a political act. It's not an economic act, right? They needed votes so, for the midterm. So that's how that works. And that'll peter out in the 2020 time frame. And then you've got this moment where interest rate normalization, the Fed no longer standing ready to buy treasury securities, when the treasury is having to issue large notes of securities, and it's hoping that the People's Bank of China is gonna buy them all, because otherwise, private bond prices will be lower and interest rates higher than they otherwise would be, will converge with whatever happens in 
the trade wars and whatever other wacky stuff uh, happens in the next year or two. So, right, this economy, the real estate market, the housing market in Hawaii, it's just the energizer bunny, it keeps going and going and going, but you gotta start to be careful about you know, where we're headed, where the risks are, you know, maybe it's time to think about asset reallocation. And by now you've read the bullet points, do I need to? Okay, so this is the review of everything I just said, which is why I'm done. Thank <laughs> you.